complace en presentar al doctor George Smooth. Smooth nació en Yukon, Florida, el 20 de febrero de 1945. Es doctor en física por el Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts en Estados Unidos. Su inclinación por el estudio de la creación lo llevó a ser el primer ser humano en asomarse al momento mismo de la generación del universo, ya que sus investigaciones cosmológicas le permiten comprender cómo ocurrió el Big Bang hace más de 13 mil millones de años. La magnitud de este hallazgo lo hizo merecedor en 2006 del Premio Nobel de Física, junto con John C. Mater. Como si fuera un arqueólogo del espacio exterior, con rigor y audacia, participó en diversos equipos de científicos e ingenieros para indagar en los primeros instantes del cosmos, en busca de las arrugas en el tiempo, que nos ha permitido entender cómo y por qué el universo está en expansión. Smoot ha trabajado en instituciones académicas como la Universidad de California en Berkeley y en el Laboratorio Nacional de Lawrence, Berkeley, de Estados Unidos, hoy presidente de Physics of the Universe del Polish Center for Cosmological Physics, desde donde se sigue explorando el surgimiento y evolución del universo. Por sus aportaciones ha recibido reconocimientos como el Premio Gruber de Cosmología y las medallas Daniel Challenge, Albert Einstein y una de la Administración Nacional de la Aeronáutica y del Espacio, NASA. De la aeronáutica y del espacio. So I'm thinking you won the Nobel Prize, what, three years ago? So you must deal with a whole lot of what has Smoot done lately. <laughs> my thought is, we continue my research as a team, you know, Cooper Smoot, alphabetical, and when we win the Nobel Prize, you'll be back on top. With all due respect, Dr. Cooper, are you on crack? <laughs> En el 2018, George Smooth publicó una nueva edición de Arrugas en el Tiempo, libro escrito junto con K.B. Davidson, en el que narra la gesta personal que le permitió alcanzar, en palabras de Steve Hawking, el descubrimiento más importante no solo del siglo XX, sino de todos los tiempos. If you, like me, you spend day after day studying the universe, you start to understand it in a different way. You get used to the time scales, you get used to the huge scales. I mean, it's very hard for people to understand how insignificant man is in the earth, you know, on the earth, except now we're starting to have global reach, but how insignificant the earth is in the solar system, how insignificant the solar system is in the galaxy, how insignificant our galaxy is compared to the billions of galaxies there are. Bienvenido to see. I did a visit, it was it yesterday, the day before yesterday, the day before yesterday yes. to Univers Universidad of Guadalajara, and the physics students, and well the science students, were asked to make a contest to make a video that best explains the concept for something I did. And two of the videos were very good, we're going to show you one, so I'm disappointed IPN didn't have a contest for people to make a video. But you will see on this simple homework assignment, this particular student that will show put a lot of time and energy to make a very nice video. So this is someone who's the same age as you. El satélite explorador del fondo cósmico, Tore, de la NASA, se colocó en órbita el 18 de noviembre de 1989 y revolucionó rápidamente nuestra comprensión del cosmos primitivo. El propósito de Kobe fue mapear con precisión la luz más antigua del universo, 
el fondo cósmico de microondas. Este satélite, desarrollado y construido en el Centro de Vuelo Espacial Goddard, en Greenbelt, Maryland, demostró que el espectro de la radiación concuerda exactamente con las predicciones basadas en la teoría del Big Bang. En esencia, Hubble produjo la primera imagen de bebé del universo, ya que creó un mapa de puntos fríos y calientes que permite a los científicos vislumbrar las raíces de la estructura cósmica que vemos a nuestro alrededor el día de hoy. La radiación de fondo de microondas es un remanente del Big Bang. Estas fluctuaciones de temperatura diminutas están vinculadas a ligeras variaciones de densidad en el universo mundial. Se cree que estas variaciones han dado origen a las estructuras que pueblan el universo actual. En algunas partes, cúmulos de galaxias, en otras, vastas regiones vacías. Por esos resultados, los científicos del COBE, John Mather, en Godard, y George Smoot, en la Universidad de California, Berkeley, compartieron el Premio Nobel de Física en 2006. Esta investigación llevó a la cosmología hacia una nueva era de mediciones de precisión allanando el camino para una exploración más profunda del fondo de microondas mediante la misión WMAP de la NASA, lanzada en 2001 y el satélite Planck de la Agencia Espacial Europea, lanzado en 2001 He had to understand enough to put that together. And so what I found in teaching is that we've made advances in teaching. But one of the ways that it's most important to get the students involved, just reading or going to lectures is not the most effective way to learn. The most effective way to learn is to do or to collaborate with people on doing stuff or teach people about it. So that was an attempt to both do something and teach people about it. And so this student learned very much about it. So I encourage you guys to think about a group project or think about making a video to explain some concept or some important thing you're doing and see what you can do. It's only two minutes long, or two and a half minutes long, but it took a lot of effort, but still very good. Bien. Bueno, pues nuevamente, buenas tardes y bienvenidos a todos a este diálogo que el profesor George Smooth va a tener con ustedes. Este, este diálogo, este espacio está dedicado para ustedes, para los jóvenes, para nuestros profesores, para todos los presentes y los invitamos a que externen sus inquietudes, sus curiosidades y hagan preguntas, le pregunten al doctor Smooth pues, eh, las dudas que ustedes tengan o eh, pues, aquellos, aquellas cosas que les inquieten sobre lo que es la investigación y la exploración del universo. Y, Déjenme comentarles que la visita del profesor George Smith es posible gracias a la Cátedra de Eugenio Méndez Ocurro, que el Politécnico eh, patrocina, ya que destinó un recurso para eh, organizar una serie de eventos académicos de la más alta calidad. Y dentro de esos eventos académicos hemos tenido eh, pues la presencia, la visita de varios investigadores distinguidos. Recuerden ustedes que el 15 de agosto que inició esta serie de, de eventos vino el doctor Jorge Cantoilla, egresado de esta escuela, Premio Nacional de Ciencias y Artes 2003 y que también nos habló sobre el exoplaneta mexicano, un planeta que descubrió. Y así como él han venido una serie de distinguidos investigadores y, y bueno, y todo, todas estas actividades que fueron organizadas por el grupo de astrofísica de esta escuela y las organizaron con motivo de aprovechando la Cátedra de Méndez Ocurro, festejar el décimo aniversario de que surgió este grupo en nuestra escuela. Desde hace 10 años empezó a haber este, eh, un grupo de investigación en astrofísica y empezó a haber tesis en astronomía y astrofísica en nuestra escuela, antes, algo que antes no ocurría. Entonces, pues eh, gracias a la Cátedra de Méndez Ocurro es que podemos poder invitar a todas sus personalidades y en particular, esta es la última visita, cerramos con broche de oro las actividades de la Cátedra en este año con la visita del profesor George Smith, Premio Nobel de Física 2006, que como eh, pues ya lo dijo en el video, él es un arqueólogo del espacio, es un arqueólogo que ha estado investigando cómo ha evolucionado el universo desde su inicio hasta nuestros días. 
Entonces, eh, well, profesor, es, welcome, welcome to Mexico. Welcome to the yeah, <laughs> bienvenido uh, to the National Polytechnic Institute and mainly to the Physics and Mathematics High, High Studies School. It's an honor to have you here. So, I thank you for accepting uh, to have this talk with the students. And uh, tomorrow we will in, we invite you to the Magistral uh, Conference lecture that he will give at the main auditorium, auditorium of the Polytechnic. So, now I ask uh, Dr. Omar Lopez to read, to say some words about the trajectory, about the academic background of Professor Smith. Okay. Uh, and the reason we're here. <laughs> the reason we're here. Okay. Um, the reason we're in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, Muchas gracias. <laughs> oh, I, I would say in English, uh, we, we will. You, you can understand. I'm not going to embarrass you. So, <laughs> not this time. Okay. So, um, sorry for speaking in English. As yes, we do have a translator. Um, so the reason we're here is, is many things. Uh, George Smoot is uh, since he won the Nobel Prize in 20. 2006, uh, he became a very strong advocate for the popular popularization of science, of cosmology. He even went to the Big Bang Theory. He was the first scientist to, to, to attend this show, which is uh, now very important, it's the most famous one. And also, he went there to, to rise the rating of this uh, show. So he, he was the first one, then Stephen Hawking has been there, as you all know. But the main reason is that we, he wrote the story of how he made the discovery. It's called Wrinkles in Time, as a Rugas en el Tiempo. So we started this because it did not, he visited La Paz in 2014, and we have, uh, he was invited to, he had this idea about giving a public lecture to everybody in La Paz, and it was very, very hard to do it because people there are mostly biologists. There's no school of physics, right? So it's not their fault. I mean, it's, it's, it's. so uh, so it was tough, and I and I I was because I am from La Paz, and, and they told me, well, you know, you organize this. So it was well, a tough thing to to do, but. We managed. We have so a thousand people. I have to interrupt. The reason we went to La Paz is the previous time yes. we did it San Jose de Cabo, and my translator was Carlos Frank. Yes. You could explain to them who Carlos Frank is. Oh, Carlos Frank's brother is. Yes. yes. <laughs> you know, Carlos Frank is a cosmologist, and a Mexican cosmologist, now a Mexican cosmologist. He wasn't before. <laughs> <laughs> it's only because he did well. Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> You're kind. <laughs> Well, Carlos Frank, who, who's uh, el hermano de Carlos Frank is uh, Julio Frank. I don't know. Why to say it in Spanish so it doesn't get the message gets clear. No, it's, uh, so Carlos is in Durham in, 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 uh, in the United Kingdom. So he was translating, and he was trying to give George's lecture. So he said, "Let's bring Omar, who cannot, you know, interrupt him and give the lecture." So we went to La Paz and we had a great time. So. Um, we started this program called La Paz Puerto de las Ciencias. Thanks to George, we invited more people from the Colegio Nacional and all these things. So we got into the fifth uh, in, uh, meeting of this La Paz Puerto de las Ciencias, and we decided to celebrate publishing his book. And this was a great adventure, the greatest thing, because my the the. The idea was just, you know, print the book and give it away. Just like that. And then, 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 then you know, Mexico changed. And I, I didn't anticipate that. And we ran out of money somehow. <laughs> so we have to go and look for other sponsors and things like that. So we got the book. People learned that, you know, there was a Nobel Prize who published this book. And this is a story about the, how he made it and all these things. And the people from the book fair, the Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara, heard about it. So then it was easy for them. They, they, they asked me, or they asked, could we invite him? And they said, yes, we, we, uh, we, let me see. 
So we called him and said, well, okay, you have to come. And what we have to be thankful to George and, and, and Nora is that, is that they are losing money while they are here. <laughs> I don't get paid while I'm here. Yes. <laughs> But you don't, you don't we spend anything. We'll make sure that you don't spend anything. So we managed to get at least 14 institutions in Mexico to put money to, to sponsor the book. And one of the main sponsors is the Politecnico. And thanks to this program that you are celebrating the 10 years of a, of a, a group of astrophysics, then, then it was a good timing, great timing. And then the state of Hidalgo came at the last minute and said, we are very interested in science and technology. We want to, to sponsor the book. And then we managed. So there it is here now. And <clears throat> so we, it's been 25 years since the book was out. So then George uh, said, well, you know, I, I, if I have to do it, I will write another book. He said, we don't have time to do that, so we better grab the translation, improve the translation, make some changes, and then... So we're very proud that this book is really good. This, uh, I think uh, uh, Tomás Granados and Grano de Sal is a, is a great printer. They are doing very well. And in, in, the, in the book fair, it's very rare that the book in science will make it to the book fair in Guadalajara. And, and well, we manage. So that's why, then in the way George came, and, and people ask if he could come to the Politecnico. He's here because of his commitment to the dissemination of cosmology. So this is also the third time I've been here, and the people here only remember two times. <laughs> yes. But, but I have come around. The reason we were doing the public lectures is that we had started the uh, Institute Advanced of Cosmology to bring the level of cosmology in Mexico up. And as part of that, we have a winter school, mm -hmm. which in colloquial Spanish is cosmología en la playa, mm -hmm. <laughs> but in official <laughs> terms, essential cosmology for the next generation. That way we could ask for money, because they won't give you money to go to the beach, but they'll give you money mm -hmm. to train the next generation. <laughs> and so there we brought in speakers. Carlos was happened to be yeah. a speaker that particular year. and. I always tried to arrange a public talk near where we were in turn I sort of do that. And I got the Department of Archaeology very interested in this. Yes. And so I got to give talks one time in Tulum yes. at the Temple of the Wind God. Big mistake. The <laughs> Wind God blew over the screen. I had to keep giving a talk while they were putting the screen back up. And and also at Chichen Itza for the end of the Maya calendar. Cool. That was a very, very <laughs> wonderful and unique experience, just because of the doing the public events regularly and then having the the Institute of Archaeology, I mean, sorry, the Department of Archaeology, wanting to have more public events at least at that time. So we did more more public events, but at that time it was also a time when we made a planetarium show, who had its world premiere here at IPN. At the thing called the, uh, for me it was called Cosmologia uh, Maya. Maya. Yeah, but you guys call it Maya Skies, which is our English name for it. And that had its world premiere here and a very big uh, kind of activity. And we now have a new planetary show, which is sometimes playing in Mexico called Phantom of the Universe. Uh, only we made it so it's free, but it's about dark matter. Why? We, what about dark matter in the universe? And I'm hoping the planetarium already has it. If not, we'll encourage them to do that. And so while we're doing direct teaching of what we hope for the next generation of cosmologists, bringing an outside speaker and other so outside people, but having roughly half of the people attending be people from Mexico, we're trying to create ties and build the next generation up. But at the same time, we try and do some public outreach mm -hmm. to let people know about the exciting things that are going on cosmology, and it's it, it becomes it, it becomes more important for the public to understand about science, to understand and share the excitement of the great discoveries, because the world is much more technical, and people have to have a positive feeling about science. And so, it turns out the more senior you get, 
when you get to be head of a department or head of a university, you understand outreach is important. When you're a low-level scientist, you're worried about your own okay. job of research and teaching. But the higher up you, you get and the more visible things get, the more you understand it's important <coughs> to talk to the public. Okay, you want to go on after I interrupt you so much? <laughs> no, no, no. We, we could begin. Yes, yes. 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 We invite the students to ask okay. questions. And pues vamos a iniciar, vamos a iniciar haciendo preguntas eh, que ustedes quieran hacer. Están los micrófonos en ambos lados. Quienes te, tengan interés en hacer una pregunta, les pedimos que se levanten y hagan una pregunta. Les tenemos una sorpresa. Bueno, déjenme decirles que, entre paréntesis, pues estamos celebrando ahora 25 años de que se escribió este libro, de que escribió este libro, George Smith, Arrugas en el Tiempo. Entonces también eso es algo interesante. Bueno, y... Aquellos que pregunten van a obtener una copia gratis de este libro. Nos animamos a que se animen a preguntar, pero el, el profesor El Mut va a decidir si se los damos o no, dependiendo de qué tan buena sea la pregunta. No, no es cierto, no es cierto. No es la pregunta. Bueno, para iniciar, para iniciar. Quiero, quiero yo este iniciar con una pregunta. Yo no quiero para Bueno, en cosmología yo soy experto en como un principiante. Un neófito, más bien. Lo voy a hacer en español y le voy a pedir a Omar que traduzca la pregunta. It should be have to be a good question. Should be a good question. Okay. Bien. Bien, la pregunta es esta. La el que se pudiera, eh, digamos, eh, detectar la radiación de fondo y poder tener una imagen de los primeros instantes del universo, todo esto ha sido posible gracias al desarrollo de la tecnología, en la que se pudieron detectar. O sea, ha sido una cuestión de tiempo a que se desarrollen detectores de alta calidad para poder detectar esto. Ahora, mi pregunta es la siguiente. Eh, bueno, esta imagen del universo de los primeros instantes tendría sentido preguntar si es, digamos, qué tan cercano es, eh, qué tiempo transcurre desde que ocurre el Big Bang hasta que se tiene esa imagen, y si eh, sería posible ir construyendo diferentes mapas del universo de cómo ha evolucionado hasta nuestros días con la detección que se haga del de fondo de microondas con los detectores que se han lanzado. Gracias. Okay, uh, Miguel is not going to get a book for this, <laughs> but he's asking like uh, that you show this in the book. I mean, you're telling us about how technology has to advance in order to to reach the point that you have enough precision to make the measurement. So Miguel is asking how long after the Big Bang is this picture that you generated? Uh, how long it took? Uh, to to be generated how how many years after the big bang okay so there's different possible ways to say what time but the universe started out as big bang and maybe through the inflationary period and then continued expansion uh, the universe is expanding continues to expand and in more recent part of the universe it it's accelerated its rate of expansion, but for the middle part of the universe life, it was slowing down, that's when structure formed. But at a certain point, when the universe is roughly a thousand times smaller than it is today, it cooled down to the point where its temperature was like the temperature of the surface of the sun, and neutral atoms began to form. It's actually cooler than the surface of the sun because the number of photons in the, from the early universe is much higher than the number of, of atoms. Mm -hmm. Right, and the sun, the, the number of photons and the number of atoms are not so vastly different, but there's a billion times as many photons as atoms in the universe today. So it pushed it down instead of uh, instead of 5,000 degrees, it's around 3,000 degrees. But the universe was a thousand times smaller than it is now. It's expanded by a factor of thousand. That temperature, because of the stretching of the light, has now become three Kelvin. And the factor of a thousand. So it's three Kelvin now, 
it was 3,000 Kelvin then. But the universe started much earlier than that. But how much earlier? We know now with very high precision. It was 379,000 years from the time the universe started to the time it cooled down enough that light could begin to flow freely directly from the last time it scattered to our observing. And I had a different video we can show. The, 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 the student showed an old-fashioned TV screen changed between channels and ultra-high frequency channels. And you can see spots of noise. Some of those spots are from the galaxy, radiation from the galaxy, but a lot of those spots are actually these photons that came from the beginning of the universe. So the time from the beginning of the universe till the time the universe started being very transparent, that's roughly the 50% point, because it doesn't happen instantly, it happens in this finite time. It's like the thickness of the skin on an orange kind of, kind of thing. And, or tangerine is a better example. Um, and it has been traveling to us with essentially, for most photons, nothing happening to them but being stretched as space expands. And they've been traveling for 13.7 million, 14.7 billion years. So, to put it in terms that are simple, if the universe now was the same age as you are, that would be approximately six hours after conception. It's when the light left. So it's extremely early embryo universe that we have made a picture of. That universe is extraordinarily smooth. It is a hundred times more smooth or spherical than the Earth is spherical. The Earth is very spherical, but not perfectly spherical. And, but there are variations, and those variations are part 100,000, 10 to the minus 5. And those variations are the ones that become galaxies and clusters of galaxies and clusters of clusters of galaxies. So they're the seeds, but they're also sound waves. They're quantum mechanical fluctuations that turn into sound waves that then show up and tell us the geometry of the universe and tell us what it is. So I usually give an example, but Nora wouldn't let me bring the bell. But I have some bells, a brass bell, a silver bell, whatever, a steel, an iron bell. You can have the same shape. The geometry of the bell determines the wavelength, the standing wavelength. The speed of sound, which is determined by the material, determines the frequency, because the wavelength times the frequency is the speed of the sound and the material, right? So. If you hear the three bells that are identical, you can tell which they're made of by hearing what notes there are. The same is true for the universe. So there's a problem when I give a general talk about this, a problem I give to the science and engineering students, which is how many galaxies should they be in the visible universe based on that you excite all the possible modes in the early universe. And galaxies are the smallest modes that survive, that you look at, that the other things are should have fragmented. So you have to know the size of a galaxy compared to the size of the universe, and you can figure it out. And so the answer to your question is, it took a long time in human scale, but a very short time on the universe's scale to get the light from the universe to be free for us to make an image. We live very far in the universe's life, and the universe is going to go on much longer, at least 100 billion years longer from the measurements we make now before something happens, or maybe not, we don't know. And uh, that's an unsolved problem. And how long did it take us to get to the alley? It took us 13.7 billion years, plus several years of working on it, to build equipment that was sensitive enough. But since that first set of observations, I, I made observations of mountaintop and balloon, and then from the satellite, each time we were improving the quality. Since that time, the sensors have double their sensitivity every one and a half to two years. So in the 30 years since then, we have had 15 doublings in sensitivity. So it's like Moore's law. We're near the quantum limit. It's easier to add more detectors than it is to improve the detectors at this stage. So we're within a factor two of the quantum limit, but now we're building detectors with thousands, instruments with thousands of detectors. We hope in the next generation, 
after the ones that are going to be running now to get up to half a million to a million detectors and the and the instruments. You have another question. Is it that you could build them up? Yes. Like you know, the, you, the, uh, can you reconstruct the whole history of evolution of the universe more, more or less? Right. If you if you were able to measure sufficiently on the sky, and that's one of the projects that's going on, and one of the projects that I managed to convince Kamasi and my colleagues here in Mexico to join is called Big Boss, but also the MS Daisy, the Dark Energy Spectroscopy Instrument. Um, our goal is to start next year and over the next five years measure the locations and the information about 20 million galaxies. Okay. And it's done with 5,000 little robots that position fibers so that you can put a wide angle telescope, a relatively wide angle telescope, which is now a kit peak and things being installed. And there are 5,000 little robot positioners they can put each fiber right on the image of the of the galaxy and run that fiber to spectro, 10 spectrographs, each one of them, you know, getting 500 galaxies in it, and measure the spectra of 5,000 galaxies simultaneously and do that. And you, 5,000 seems like a lot, but you've got to do that several times a night, right? If you want to do, you know, at, at least 2 million a year, how many do you have to do a night? You've got to do a lot, right? And, and so you have to think about how to do that. And then we want to do it in the southern hemisphere. And there you want to measure these galaxies and their positions so you can map out concentric spheres around us because I can look out to galaxies that are a billion light years away and the light just arrives now, but it started a billion years ago. I see what a galaxy looks like a billion years ago. I look at galaxies that are two billion light years away I see what they were like two billion years ago. So each sphere around us gives me a snapshot of the universe at different times. Therefore, you can hope to map out the whole history of the universe by just looking. Thank you. Did I earn the book? He earned his book, but what no, I should have done. He cheated, he used his prerogative. He should have let the students go first. But we have a student now. Uh, yeah. uh, so look, we have one student? Only one? <laughs> All right. Okay. No more. Right. If there's no more students, I'm going to give you a quiz. Lock the doors in the back, please. <laughs> Solo quiero decir algo. Estos libros son gracias a la Fundación Politécnico. Fue la que aportó los recursos para poder tener estos libros del profesor Esmol. Entonces, gracias a la Fundación Politécnico, es que tenemos estos libros. Está ganando este lado, queremos más de este lado. Adelante, por favor. Puede ser en las preguntas en inglés, como quieras. Come closer. No, no, no. Please, come to the microphone. You want me to use it? Just, just speak clearly. Very different question. There are two different questions. Okay, so let me give you an example of how you can see what happened earlier. If you look at the sun, you can only see the surface of the planet that's scattered around. However, if you look at sound waves that are propagating in the sun, they come and cause an effect on the surface. So if you are a science student, you know there are normal modes of oscillation. If you lose the satellites or careful ground observatories, you can measure up to L equals 2,000, right? So you know, sort of harmonics. That means you can measure 2,000 frequencies, but as you go up in L, there are two L plus one different frames. So you can measure this huge set of sound waves on the surface of the sun, 
And some of those sun waves go around the surface of the sun, but some of them go down through the center of the sun. And you can actually probe what conditions are like at the center of the sun by seeing how the sound wave changes because you measure the frequency, the material, the, 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 the temperature dependent, the, the, the speed of sound depends upon the temperature. If you should remember, it goes, you should be able to calculate from KT the, the, the speed of sound. So you can actually learn about what's going on in the center sun by measuring the sound waves. We have a slightly different thing in the Big Bang. We have the beginning, where it's very, very hot, very, very dense, and your timing is not the geometry of the sphere of the sun, but it is the geometry of time. <coughs> you have a starting time, and then you have a, a sound wave, and you have this other edge, right? If the sound wave goes to zero at this other edge, you don't see it. But if the sound wave goes to the max, you see that on the surface, and so forth. So you can see the sound waves that came from very early in the universe and understand what was going on better in the early universe. So you are not completely blind. You can't make a, a precise image. But you can think about this. If a woman is pregnant, she goes in for a checkup, an ultrasound is done, but it's displayed where you can see it by light. It's a, it's a similar kind of thing. It's, the sound waves go in and reflect off the embryo, come back to the surface and make a surface wave. Microphones pick it up, you turn it into an image you can see. So this is a very similar kind of activity, except we don't make the sound waves. The sound waves were generated very early on. And we know we can extrapolate back. So they were asking me earlier in the conversation about why I knew Steve Hawking. One of the earliest reasons that I knew Steve Hawking was he was proving the singularity theorems. And he took, he read the data I'd taken from the early experiments, the, the ground based and the balloon, of the aircraft experiments, and then later, but, but at that point it was up to the aircraft. And he read that we measured the universe to be isotropic to better than a part in a thousand, and certain ways better than that. And he misinterpreted it, but he said, if you can shrink the universe back to a thousand times smaller, then the energy in the radiation itself is now a thousand times hotter, and it goes as T to the fourth for total energy, is enough to collapse the universe, and it must have a singularity at the beginning. Now, he was off on uh, reading our data by a little factor, but later he was right, right? And, and that's when I got the matter, because I had the data and he had the theory at the, at the, at the kind of time. So that was the answer to you guys' this question in the, earlier. So this is a different question. <laughs> okay. But so the issue is, you can know that all the 100 billion galaxies are in the visible universe because we measure the precision of the microwave background. It tells us the precision of the expansion of the universe is uniform to that level. That means you can extrapolate back to when the universe was now 100,000 times smaller. Then the energy in the cosmic microwave background, or now it's cosmic background because it's now in the X-rays and gamma rays, is sufficient to make the universe go back to where quantum gravity is important. And so now you have to say, how can I see evidence of that, whatever it is? And so these fluctuations we see, we believe, and when you do the calculations, you predict the stuff we see within 1%. So it's so very self-consistent, but we're still looking for the smoking gun. We believe in the very early phase of the universe, it went through a phase we call inflation. In that case, it was expanding, it accelerates up to expands incre incredibly rapidly, and the horizon size is smaller than the size of an atom by a very large factor, it's smaller than a proton by a large factor, even though the 100 billion galaxies information is in there, but the galaxies are not. Um, and when you get something that small, quantum mechanics becomes important. You get fluctuations in the infanton field, and you also get fluctuations in the metric of space and time, because you're creating space and time because you're accelerating, you're expanding space and time in such an incredible amount. It's expanded as much in that fraction of a second as it has since then, at least on the, on the same scale. And so, those quantum mechanical fluctuations, you could predict what their spectrum should look like. And that's what we observe with the cosmic microwave background. It's a very flat spectrum. 
It's almost independent of scale. It's scale, it's scale free, but very close to scale invariant. And that means that inflation had a very flat potential, and therefore the expansion rate was very constant. Right? And so our galaxy was once a quantum mechanical fluctuation. The cluster of galaxies are the clusters of clusters of galaxies, and things even on bigger scale are, are the result of quantum fluctuations. And the universe has been an incredible microscope. Because of inflation, it expanded by at least 30 orders of magnitude. And since then, it's done about 30 of magnitude. So something that was a tiny quantum fluctuation is now a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. And you can look for evidence of that, right? But it's also telling you how space and time itself were created. And during that phase, you're dominated by four-dimensional space-time. It doesn't mean that earlier it was not even more complicated. But that, if you just have the four of them grow immensely, they dominate all the others in, in the present day. He gets a book. <laughs> just because he kept shaking his head like he understood it. <laughs> not that he really did. So, as you can see. Good evening. Uh, I, uh, I have two questions for you. The first one would be... You still only get one book. <laughs> <laughs> if it's good. Yeah, that's right. uh, lately, I, I've seen... I don't know whether I'm barely starting the, the career, so uh, bear with me, but lately, uh, whatever I can tell about more advanced physics, uh, there's this kind of... Uh, on uh, disagreement on about what would be the actual state of uh, the universe in the sense I see a lot of uh, scientists believe in the theory of multiple universes and many others believe in uh, other theories as supersymmetry I, I would like to know in your field of research in whatever you, you've been able to make out with uh, your work what would be your view on this uh, on these speculations. Okay, so that's a good question, in a certain sense. So, there are some scientists that get off very far on track and go to very unusual speculations. There are some scientists who make suggestions that there is no evidence for, but may become important. Supersymmetry is an example of something which is very beautiful theory of which there is not yet any empirical evidence, right? It may or may not be true. So this is part of the way science goes. There is a core. The difficulty is in popular books, some of them present things that are very speculative on equal footing with things that are, that are very well established. So we have a theory of the universe it's basically a phenomenological theory, which is very simple to me now, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't 20 years ago, <laughs> or, or 40 years ago. And that is, we have added four more features to everything that we know. That is, we add inflation, this device in order to make space and time, and we add it to the same blue as possible way. It's put in as a scalar field with a flat potential, and you let it roll slowly down this very flat potential, and the universe expands, but slows down a little bit, eventually stops, and that energy is put in to make the ant matter and energy we see in the universe. That makes the space time, it makes the stage, and makes the material for the ant characters that are going to be there. Then we have dark matter, which is added. We also make the excess of matter over antimatter. Those are things we still don't have evidence for. But we put that in by hand, in the simplest way, and, and uh, it, uh, it, we do calculations and simulate how galaxies should form, and that all fits together. So those are all, in some sense, speculations, but they're speculations that you can calculate with. One of the reasons inflation is so good is it's actually a very powerful and strong theory, but you can calculate it very well. There are alternative approaches people tried, which you couldn't calculate well, but also do not seem to agree with observations now that we've gotten more and more precise. But then you're getting into the epoch where we use known physics from high energy physics on, 
and there isn't much uncertainty. It's a complication of calculations to get that all right but, and get enough observations. But we're, we're, we're on firm footing from that time. You know, there's a, four things we kind of put in by hand, but the rest of the stuff is just the standard physics that you, you can see in textbooks. So in textbooks, things are generally right. In popular science, not so much, right? Not, not always so, so, so right. And so that's the issue as you become a more advanced student. You eventually get to the point where you're not reading out a textbook, but you're reading current papers that people have written. And the big shock comes to realize that this paper is wrong. This is not right, right? And this, I've had grad students like tear their hair out because they can't believe that stuff they read isn't right. And I say, you've reached the frontier of knowledge. You're at a point where you can start contrib contributing to knowledge. But you read these other things, and you see what people say, and you judge whether they're right or not, or a whole reservation. But you also look for great ideas or things to think about to test, or new approaches, or whatever it is. Can you apply this over here? So there's a, a lot of stuff going on. So the answer is, you're right. You have to learn to develop the judgment as to what has got a solid foundation, what can appear in books, you know, and what is speculation that may disappear in the future and be replaced by other kinds of theories. And I have, uh, you know, there are still people going around teaching their students about MON, which is Modified Newtonian Dynamics, and I, I think they're criminal. They should be prosecuted as thesis <laughs> advisors because they're teaching people skills that they know is wrong, if they even think about it a little bit. But somehow they, they get to give talks on it or whatever it is like that. And, and, and so you have to you have to know that that uh, I once threatened to sue my thesis advisor because he taught me one thing wrong, and I could have discovered the you know this, the grand unified theory. Uh, but the fact is, you have to know that not everything that you read about and see and hear people talking about is on a solid footing, or even has evidence for it. There is no evidence for string theory. There's no evidence for a grand unified theory, although it seems it's been, people in Europe have been teaching it for so many years, they all believe it. They, they know it's a heresy not to believe it, even though there's no evidence for it. But string theory has been around quite some time. There is yet to be any, any evidence. It certainly inspires people to think of a lot of different ways, right? But, you know, you, that's part of learning. That's part of maturing as a researcher is to learn what stuff is so tight and interconnected you can't violate it, and does this new thing fit in and do that? We had an exciting time when the accelerated universe, the late accelerated universe was discovered because it was confirmed very quickly by another experiment, but also it fit in the existing picture extremely well. It made things fit better than it did before. So it got accepted very quickly, whereas if it had made things all a big mess, it, would, it still wouldn't be accepted now. Give him a book. <laughs> no, don't give him another question. <laughs> give the next student. We go, to the, we go to her. Everybody should have a chance. He, already, he cheated. He took the first question and he made two of them. All right. We have to give the students a chance. Buenas noches. <risa> Hace algún tiempo había leído un artículo donde eh, a, de, escribían cómo se había descubierto la radiación de fondo de microondas y había dicho que fue una antena de Nueva Jersey, si no me parece fue en 1969 y fue de, pues, de una forma espontánea, esporádica e inesperada. Y muchos de estos hallazgos científicos eh, han sido así, por ejemplo, eh, los rayos X por, por este Roger, eh, la, radiación, la radiación por Henry Becker y Mary Curie, y por ejemplo, eh, también muchos, muchas teorías científicas, por ejemplo, la teoría de la relatividad especial que, que predecía eh, los agujeros negros y el universo en expansión, eh, pues ha sido así, ¿no? 
Entonces mi pregunta es acerca de si cree que la ciencia va a seguir este, progresando eh, con este tipo de incidentes, donde eh, años antes eh, otras teorías científicas predecían su existencia, pero tiempo después de, de forma esporádica y sin que nadie se lo esperaba fueron descubiertos, como recientemente por el de gravitatorias. Bueno, esa es mi pregunta. <risa> ok, es <risa> okay, uh... She gives a big preamble to the question. <laughs> it is You're as bad as Carlos. Yeah. Skipping over the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, the question is, like, CMB was discovered by accident. Yes. By Pencius and Wilson. Becker and what? But there were people at Princeton at the time starting an experiment to discover it on purpose. Yes. So... The question that she's asking is the same with X-rays. What was this more the serendipitous discovery? Yes. So she's asking, like, if, if are we going to continue like that? Are there opportunities for you know, like, out of the blue, you could make a discovery that can be fundamental? So the answer is yes. You can expect. <laughs> see. <laughs> the answer is you can expect discoveries of sort of three types. You can expect discoveries where pe people are doing an experiment in a field that you think is completely isolated. You know, like Christian, looking to see if, if uh, energetic particles came from the sun, and he discovers x-rays, and that becomes a way to look inside of people without cutting them open and revolutionizes medicine, right? There are other examples of, of, of things where people are doing very careful experiment in one area, as this is Wilson. They were commissioned by Bell Labs to see if it was possible to put a communication satellite in orbit. They needed to know what the noise background was. But they did such a good job that they, they were able to find the, the, the fundamental ratio for the universe. And, but there are also cases where people go to a new threshold. They build a device that can see things 10 times as well. Right? A classic example is the CERN accelerator, where they built it to test the electric weak theory, and then they upgraded it to the point where they could do the search for the Higgs boson. It was a discovery predicted. It's a discovery that happened because they built tools that were much better. Right? If you, every time you increase your sensitivity by order of magnitude, you have a reasonable chance you'll make a discovery. Right? That that's the, the, the kind of thing. Another way that discoveries are made is that people realize a thing they discovered over here and something that was discovered and being studied over here are the same thing, and it's like they were seeing it from two different sides. You know, you see you see the skeleton from the front, you see it from the side. They look different, or the elephant. But when you realize it's the same thing, you make a new discovery. You make a deeper understanding. That's also a discovery, and it's very common in, in biology and in health that people make discoveries in two different areas and then they realize it's the same visible mechanisms going on in the cells and then they understand the machinery of the cells much better. And so we're going to expect new discoveries, but there are some discoveries that are not going to revolutionize. I mean, think about one that, we'll, that I'll talk about briefly tomorrow, which is Newtonian physics was a great discovery. He built on Galileo and some other people, but basically he figured out the motion mechanics of things and the universal law of gravitation. That Newtonian physics reigned supreme for 200 and something years until Einstein put out general relativity. And now, how much difference does it make that Einstein general relativity replaced Einstein's Newtonian physics? The answer is when you drive your car, when you're building bridges and so forth, you still use Newtonian physics. It's still valid, right? You can't overrun it because it was experimentally well established that it was valid in this region, right? General relativity is valid over a bigger region. It changes a lot our perspective our view of the world is changed very radically because we now see about space-time being curved, many other things like that. 
but rarely in science and engineers do we use general relativity unless we're in astrophysics with cosmology, then we use it because it's the dominant force on the large scale of the universe. And so there are the kind of serendipitous discoveries you can have cannot completely throw over the laws we already established because many of them have strong empirical basis and they're known to be valid in certain regions in the sense they give the right answers when you do calculations. It doesn't mean if I flip over your view of what's actually going on, your perspective and your philosophical feelings about it, but it's still going to give you the same answer. She gets a book. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> so what discovery did you make? <laughs> no, I asked her if she needed a translation of what you say. Oh. And I was going to say, yes, see. Tengo demasiadas preguntas, pero pues solo puedo decir una, así que trataré de reducirlo lo más corto posible. Este, si el universo sigue en expansión, entonces alcanzaría un límite y si es así, ¿qué pasaría después? ¿Podría, ¿Se detendría o podría volverse a comprimir y provocar otro Big Bang? La pregunta es que si el universo es expandido, ¿podría continuar por siempre? ¿O qué pasaría? ¿Podría parar y luego algo más pasaría? Something else, something else what is what, what follows? Okay, so that was a question that was a question when I was your age. And we used to have the view uh, that was taken from McKendler, McKendler's book on geopolitics, the, the, the you know, geography is destiny, it's geometry is destiny. In the old days, we thought the curvature of space and the ultimate destiny of space were linked. If space is flat, it was going to go expanding forever, but more and more and more and more slowly, so it almost wasn't doing it. And if space was open, it would keep expanding and never slow down completely. It would always keep expanding. And if it was curved, it would reach, it would slow down, reach a peak, and come, come back down. Do I need to translate it or not? Okay. okay. Right. So then the problem came. We discovered that the later universe, starting about five billion years ago, was starting to accelerate its rate of expansion. If the universe is full only of the matter and energy we knew about, it must continue to slow down. And in fact, the people doing those experiments that measured this were actually looking to see how fast the universe was slowing down so they could predict the future. But what they found out was there is something causing the universe to accelerate. And that means either we had to add a term back that Einstein put in, called the cosmological constant, or put it something equivalent on the other side, which we call dark energy, that could cause it. So if you have an equation that the curvature, the, 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 the gravity is on this side, which is the curvature of space-time plus the cosmological constant times the g mu. But, and here is the, ma the matter energy stress. You can take something from this side and put it on that side. Right? It's messy, but it turns out the cosmological constant is easy because you can just put it over here as a vacuum energy and it works out. But it doesn't have to be a fixed vacuum energy. It could be dynamical. Once you allow that possibility, you no longer completely tie the geometry to the destiny of the universe. So we were able, with the cosmic microwave background, to show that on the very large scales, the universe is very close to flat. That it's at least 10 times the radius of, the radius of curvature of the universe is at least 10 times the visible size of the visible universe. So it's, ex but actually probably tighter than that now. But it's very, it's very, very flat on the large scales. And your anticipation is it should be flat for lots of, it makes it easier to make structure. Many things make it flat. If there was inflation, it drives the universe very big. Because even if the universe was a small sphere, make that sphere third order of magnitude bigger, the rate of curvature is much smaller. So 
we have reason to think the universe is flat, but it doesn't have to be exactly flat. It can be close to it. This dark energy, though, can take things that are either closed or open and keep them going out forever. And one of the problems is, will the dark energy stay as a constant, a relative constant, as it driven to a, an attractor and it's going to sit there, or is it going to change dynamically in time? And it could go two ways. So the, there's the good way where it turns into ordinary matter and energy, and the universe continues to slow down in a reasonable way, and it's flat, it'll coast, and it'll last a really long time, at least 100 billion years. But it could decide to go the other way. It could decide to get more repulsive. And then we get to die in the big rip. Okay. So if you make it so that the thing causing the universe to accelerate gains a huge amount of energy and gains a huge amount of power, it can actually cause the universe to accelerate faster and faster. And in you know a couple billion years, all the galaxies that there are, that we can see are outside our horizon. Our local group is merging, but even the edge of the galaxy is starting to go outside of the horizon. And then the, the speed is picking up, it's getting faster and faster. And pretty soon it tears your body to shreds. And then it tears the atoms in your body to shreds. And then it tears the protons and neutrons in your nucleus to shreds. And that's the end, that's the big rip. Right? And so we don't know the answer, right? We got a suspicion. I don't think we'll die in the big rip, but maybe. And we don't know. We have to learn what this dark energy is to know the ultimate fate of the universe. Thank you. Um, you think you should give a book? I think you should. It's absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I have. So in the intro video, uh, it said that Stephen Hawking said you that the discovery was the greatest discovery of, of all time? Well, he, he really said it was the most important discovery of the century, oh. perhaps of all time. <laughs> so that but, because I didn't pay him enough. <laughs> <laughs> that would make you the greatest discovery of, discoverer of the century. Do you agree with that title? Or, or do you think so? Well, I used it on the cover of the book. Yeah, it says, <laughs> it says, but, but you have to understand, both Stephen and I well, Stephen, particularly at that moment, needed uh, a discovery like this, just like he needed the data earlier. Mm -hmm. He had put out the brief history of time, and he needed some evidence that what he was talking about, some, some exciting new. You have to, you're, you're too young to understand. At the time, it was really, the time that we announced this discovery, it was really big news around the world. But it got to be extremely big news in England, in Great Britain, because at the time the Church of England was going through a big crisis, and they were having a meeting of all the bishops to talk about how they could revive religion in Great Britain. And here is the face of God. <laughs> not, not my word. I didn't say those words, but I was quoted as saying those words. And, and so it made the front page, and then it made the science page, then it made the religious pages, and then it bounced back to the, you know. So it was a, it was a very, very big story in, in Great Britain at the time, right at the time that Stephen Hawking was putting his book out. And so he wrote that as part of the publicity for getting the Brief History of Time, which sold, I believe, on the, scale, on the order eventually worldwide, two million copies. It was a, and it was a, that, that was one of the really big changes uh, that started to make people realize that before that, popular science books had been complete busts. No one, you know, no one bought those. You're lucky if a thousand people bought your book if it was a science book. And suddenly, here's a book that sells two million, right? And so there's an agent who, who called me up immediately during the time all the reporters are, but somehow managed to get through to me and said, we want to sell your book, right? Because there are people excited by Hawking's book, but you're getting all this incredible news, right? And so my book turned out to do reasonably well for a, a non-fiction book, not like Stephen Hawking's book. But I think it's, it was 40 or 60,000 copies. Oh, and, and then the, 
the, the English and American versions did about eight or nine editions. Right? It, it sold reasonably well at that time because there was a lot of news. And so I used Stephen Hawking's quote on the bottom of the book <laughs> to sell more books. It has helped because it's mean science popular books have become more of a staple, although we'll, we'll see. They still don't sell huge numbers. But, but anyway, so it served Hawking's purpose, and then I turned around and used it. And, and it turns out to be for the good, because it has allowed many more people to write science books. Unfortunately, some of them are like the question. Many of the books try and be spectacular, or you know, they talk about extra dimensions or various other things that are extreme, or that your brain uh, may be, you know, uh, quantum entangled completely, and that's why humans can always outthink the computer no matter what. Uh, uh, even though I think the computers are laughing at the world champions of, of chess. Um, you know, there are people who are putting out things that are scientific speculation, but they're, they're, they're sensationalizing them. But the fact is, there are still now many more science books available than others. So, yeah. So I paid Hawking and Hawking paid me. No, no real cash trade in change, change stands. Miguel, um, Antes de que continuemos, tengo que hacerte una propuesta. Eh, el doctor viene muy cansado. ¿no? La segunda vez de que dijimos que ya iba a ser como una hora, ya, ya llegamos más o menos a donde estamos tocando el fondo. Eh, la pregunta es de que si podemos hacer dos preguntas y comprar el resto de los que van a preguntar y de regalarles un libro y seguir con el programa de hoy para que puedan ir a descansar. ¿Sí? No sé si, si pueden, este, si ustedes lo acepten, que les, les compremos el lugar en la fila con un libro ¿no? y, y ya limitemos, porque es que el, el speaker se, se tarda mucho contestando, ¿no? Así que si cualquiera de ustedes, de los que están ahí, se les va a regalar un libro, ya Miguel dijo que sí. Este, que alguien que tenga una, así, una pregunta, dos preguntas, así fuertes, y que se avienten, ¿no? Uno, uno de un lado y otro. Yo propondría lo siguiente. There are too many students, too many questions. I know. It would take a long time, yeah. What, what I, I propose that they send by email oh. questions. Yeah, send them to Omar. <laughs> okay, entonces, le hacemos. Or, or we can have them send them to you. Yeah, you don't have to apologize already. No, no hay problema, lo pueden. Les voy a dar el correo del doctor Omar, el mío. Mientras sus preguntas, vamos a hacer lo siguiente: dos preguntas de cada lado y se acabó. Ok, el güey va uno. Otro de aquí, ¿quién, ¿quién se avienta? Pero, pero a los que ya están formados les vamos a obsequiar su libro. Su libro les vamos a dar. ¿Quién se queda? Dos, dos preguntas y ya cuatro preguntas. Dos preguntas de este lado y dos preguntas de este lado. Es porque el speaker toma so long to answer. I know he does. <laughs> He's trying to avoid the hard question. Uh, bueno, el, el doctor Edmund está contestando ampliamente las preguntas. Este, creo que esta es una característica de él. Eh, obviamente esto nos tomaría mucho, pero el doctor Edmund también. Se vino del aeropuerto directo para acá. O sea, Let's have him ask a question. Y toda la semana estuvo. A ver, que estaba listo, ¿de qué lado? ¿Tú y tú listo? Vamos a dar dos preguntas más de acá. ¿Para qué? ¿A quién, a quién los compramos? Al, al resto les compramos su lugar. Ok. Survive, we are buying their places with books. So we're giving them books. So we will just give you four questions. Right. Well, we want to get their questions. Yeah. We don't get the books till they send the questions. Okay. <laughs> there is one question. And this. Uh, which aspect of the early phases of the universe has interacted with the most, and why? Which, no, which which aspect of the early phases of the universe have has interacted with the most, and why? Which early phases? Of ¿Qué aspecto del universo temprano te ha te entregado más y por qué? Ah, which of the early phases of the universe have impressed you, impressed you the most? And why? Okay. So, all right. So I have a, a different answer to this. So when I'm giving advice to graduate students and postdocs, 
about what projects to do. I tell them to pick an important project and one that can be done in less than five years. There's many important projects you can think of that might take a hundred years, but you should be able to think what's really important, but I can get an answer within five years. And in that regard, you're always optimistic, but whatever you, for a lifetime on a grad student, or you want to be able to do, or a postdoc, you want to be able to do things within five years. And so the thing that I focused on about the early universe the most is what we can learn about inflation, that, that early phase. And that, that is a very early phase. It could be on the scale of 10 to the minus 32 seconds. And so forth. But it's a big, powerful, important thing. And we know there is some impact. We know there is the fluctuations we observe. There should be also fluctuations in the metric, which you could possibly see in the polarization pattern in the microwave background. It should also be a small amount of non-Gaussianity, that the fluctuations themselves are almost perfectly Gaussian. That means the forces that are making space and time are linear. That means the potential is explosively close to quadratic, very close to quadratic. And so you can look and see there are four things that you can think of that will be relics that you can measure and determine the properties of the of what went on during inflation, even though it happened in incredibly early universe. That doesn't stop people from speculating what might have happened even earlier than that. I don't think we'll get much experimental evidence on that for quite some time. So I follow my own advice. Try and pick things that you think you can actually make progress on in a, in a, career, in a career stage level. Yeah. OK. Give him a book. Thank you. One book. Yeah, he has. He, he has the book. He got the book before the question. Now he bought it. Now he bought it. Okay. Okay. ¿Tú ya lo tenías o lo compraste? Okay. Okay. Is the dark and er energy, is the dark energy or the dark matter, uh, could explain how our universe? is most uh, matter and not anti-matter. And uh, for example, we have uh, the CP violation, uh, but it's not enough to, to explain this uh, uh, this anti-symmetry and we can... Uh, and if not the, the case, uh, with the actual evidence, uh, what uh, what could be the, the way to follow, uh, to, to answer that, that question? Okay. So, so, yes. so the, the first part is, Andrei Sakharov, who was the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, was under house arrest, in his, he and his wife were under house arrest, he more than her, in later years. But he managed to work on this problem and have his wife and friends smuggle out a paper to be published in the West. And he listed the four conditions that are necessary to make up the very anti-symmetry. The fact that, that matter over anti-matter dominates in the later universe. And CP violation is one of the, of the four. You need thermal mild equilibrium. You need some time asymmetry kind of a, a situation. And so he, he listed those very carefully, and those are still thought to be the correct treatment because they're very general in terms of what he what he did. Now, when we talk about dark matter and dark energy, we know some of their properties, but not all their properties. We don't even know if dark matter is a particle or whatever it is. The best implications are it's particles, but it could be very, very last, very, very low mass particles that are in and uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, solitons, and, and uh, they, or it could be extremely heavy particles, and Webzilla's, and then Webs are the main range. People are looking where the lights are, right? And, and, and they quoted the Webb miracle, which just happened to be if you make a weak interaction cross-section and you make the mass in the 100 GeV range, you will get 100% of the missing. Uh, you, you, at the time, you got a make equals one. Now you need a make equals 
he needed to be a quarter of the total energy. And, and so the one miracle turned out to be a half, a quarter miracle, and not necessarily true. So we don't know what it is, and we don't know what its properties are. A lot of people who like to think the supersymmetry is right want it to be the lightest supersymmetric particle. 